history. Your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. Welcome to uh, Ridley Park Presbyterian Church. Uh, we're glad that you have chosen to be here this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, please uh, sign the visitor's card located in the pew rack in front of you and uh, put that in one of the plates uh, as you leave the building. Our mission partner, Andy Jacob, who is the director of Chester Eastside Ministries, will be sharing with us in a minute for, mix minute for mission next Sunday. Uh, so we encourage you to come out and hear him, and then we'll have a coffee cafe um, reception following the worship service, and you can, he'll be here for that as well, and you can ask him any questions you might have. The annual meeting of the Congregation and Corporation of the Ridley Park Presbyterian Church is scheduled for 1015 on February 11th. Uh, the purpose, this is a different way than what we've done before. We're still having both services, and the meeting will be between the services. Uh, so uh, if you attend the um, first service, stay just a bit later, and we'll have the meeting. Uh, and if you're attending the second service that Sunday, make sure to come early for the meeting. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to receive reports from church organizations, receive the 2024 church budget, elect corporation officers, and any other business that is presented to the body. There are other announcements that you will have received in your, um, 
church email. If you do not receive the church emails, please email us at rppcusa.org. Uh, and we'll make sure to get you. That's our website. I think right. Info. Info at RPPC. I knew there was something missing, but I couldn't remember what it was. Info at RPPC. USA. USA dot, dot org. There we go. Some of us need prayer. So let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you for your grace and your goodness, your amazing love for us. Help us to trust you. Help us to find our place in your church, in your body. And by your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work in us today in a special way to, to help us to understand who we are as your sons and daughters, who we are collectively, uh, not only here, but around the world and through the ages as your church called to fellowship with you. And may these truths impact us. May the eyes of our hearts be enlightened that we would understand these deep and glorious truths. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one.
Kids, come on down. Okay, kids, we're going to do it backwards today. Cadence is my microphone. She's a mic stand today. Thank you, mic stand. Okay, I'm gonna turn this this way. We've provided beautiful photos on the screen for you folks who, not yet, who can't see what I'm doing. Okay, you guys, we came home from a Christmas vacation and our plant looked like this. After a few hours, it looked like this. What do you think made it look better? Anybody have an idea of what made that plant look better? What kind of? Water. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay, what looks better? These Or these. Which ones, Anthony? Come here, point to the ones. Yes, I think so too. What do you think these have that these don't? Water. <laughs> Glad we have visual aids in row two. <laughs> All right, now. What's that? Ice cream sandwich. I bought this and I didn't open it yet. So I probably need somebody to come open it for me. Anthony, come on over here. 
Can you open that? I don't know what's gonna, like, nothing's gonna explode or anything, but I wanna see what that ice cream sandwich looks like. It look, it's called astronaut ice cream. Can you hold it over this and open it up? Let's see how, how astronaut ice cream looks. And let the kids all see it. Kids, come on around. Does that look super yummy delicious? <laughs> what's, what's missing? What's missing from that one? What do you think? Okay, I can hold this down. Thank you. Connor, what do you think? <clears throat> Water. <laughs> So if you had to choose the items, which would you choose? The ones with water or the ones without the water? The ones with the water. You know what? The Bible says that talking to Jesus is like water for us. We need to talk to Jesus every single day in order to know him really well. And if we don't spend time with Jesus, it's like our friendship with him just dries up. Let's pray and ask Jesus to help us to remember to talk to him every day. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the living water, and I pray that you'll help each one of us to remember and to take time to talk to you and stay close to you every single day. Bless these kids and their teachers in Sunday school. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, have fun. If your parents allow, you can come back and try this stuff after the service. Please join me now in the unison prayer of confession, which we will follow by a time of silently confessing our sins before God. Lord Jesus, we have sinned times without number, and we have been guilty of pride and unbelief. We have neglected our relationship with you as we live our daily lives. Our sins and shortcomings present us with a list of accusations, but we thank you that they will not stand against us, for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver us from every evil habit, every interest in former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in us, and everything that prevents us from taking delight in you. Scripture assures us as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. In other words, they are removed. They have no claim upon us any longer. And we know that while we live in this world, our sins still nag us. But when God looks at you, he sees you as completely and totally forgiven, totally clean in Jesus Christ. So know that and live that and look forward to the day when you will stand before him and he will welcome you as one who is clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for your word revealed to us. Your word in scripture that we can hold in our hands, that we can read on our own, that we can absorb by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit helping our understanding. And we thank you for your word revealed in Jesus Christ, the one who was part of the Holy Trinity at creation, part of creating your word, which was spoken, and then it existed. And that word became flesh in Jesus Christ. And it's bigger than we think. You are bigger than we think. Your grace is bigger than we think. Your call upon our lives is bigger than we think. So I pray and I ask this congregation to pray with me that you by your Holy Spirit would help us to expand our view of you, expand our view of ourselves and the call you have placed on us and expand our view of your church, that we would no longer see this as a social gathering place, but a place where we are equipped to do the work, the work of your kingdom. the big work of your kingdom empowered by your Holy Spirit. We pray that your spirit would accompany your written word today to help us 
to expand our view of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Continuing in our series in Ephesians, uh, we're looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and beginning at verse 11 this week. We looked at verse 11, I believe, last week, 11 through 14, and that's just a refresher. And then we'll be really focusing this morning on 15 through 23. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom, and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Not long ago, a book was written about the church and how people view the church. And uh, this author um, said that a lot of people seem to view the church not really through the eyes of Scripture, the eyes uh, that God wants to illuminate for us to understand what is truly happening here, but with other models. And one of those models was uh, the gas station. How do you use a gas station? Well, you pull in, you fill up your car, and you hope that that gas lasts you to the next time you need to get to a gas station. For some, uh, it might be next week when you can come back to church and be filled up again. For others, it might be um, the time between Christmas and Easter, and then you get filled up again. And, and that one's supposed to last the whole way to next Christmas. People come in to be filled up. But that's not what the church truly is. Yes, that happens, but that's not everything. Another model is the drugstore. Oh, I'm feeling a little dreary, a little down. I think I'll go to church for a pick-me-up. Uh, the prescription uh, will be handed to me, and, and I'll take it in, and I'll feel better. A friend of mine, once after we went to a church service, um, we came out, and she goes, I just didn't get my warm and fuzzy feelings in that church. And I'm like, is that what you want? <laughs> She's grown a lot since then. And of course, it's nice to feel good upon leaving church. But that's not what the church truly, ultimately is. Another model is the movie theater. You come in. And the weird thing is, you, you don't buy a ticket, but um, there is a place at the, at the door where you can uh, put some money in, maybe the cost of a movie, which you know is going up. And then you expect to be entertained for a while, and you expect the entertainment to be good. And if it's not good, you feel like you don't get your money's worth, and maybe you don't give as much the next time. And then there's the the other model, which is church as the big box store. You go in and you want to find everything you need, everything you want. You want to find the best product at the lowest cost to you. 
So people come to church and they hope to have a really awesome Sunday school program for their kids. They want to hear really good quality music because they want the best product. And so people view the church as a big box store. And what this is called is the consumerist mindset. And I, I'm sorry to say that there are many people, churchgoers, who are consumerists in how they view the church. They look for the church with the best product, and hopefully at the lowest cost to them, of their resources, time, money, energy, etc. All of these models focus on what I can get from the church. What does church do for me? What does coming to church do for me? And if it does something I like, I'll come back. And if it doesn't, I'll go away. Maybe I'll find another big box store church and see what products they have. But that is such a small, no matter how big the box store, no matter how big the church, it is still too small to contain God's vision for what the church of Jesus Christ is. The church is the people who have been connected with the Creator and who have been connected with the Creator to live in fellowship with Him and to serve him, and to represent and demonstrate the kingdom of God to the world. The plan of God for all of eternity is uh, been entrusted to the church to share with the world. The church is a connection with God and a global connection and a throughout history connection with God's people. In verse 15, Paul says, because I heard of your faith, and that is why um, I read 11 through 14 as well, he's saying you are included in this. So therefore, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for the Lord's people, those are the two measures of them being included. Um, It's God's work, but we see it, we see it demonstrated in our love for God and our love for each other. And because he has seen that in the Ephesians, he gives thanks and he prays for them that they may have wisdom, that God will reveal himself and his plan to them, the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. And then in verse 18, the the climax of the passage, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know. What does Paul want us to know? Number one, the hope to which he has called you. The hope of God's kingdom, the hope of eternal life, the hope of connection with God, the hope that says no matter what our circumstances, God is with us, no matter what happens to us, it will not undo us because God is stronger and God's plans are good and God will work all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All things. Sometimes we go through a challenge and we're like, I hate that. I don't like this challenge. And yet at the other side, we see what God has accomplished through it. Other times we go through a challenge and we hate it. But we don't see what God has accomplished right away. But that does not mean that God has not been working in all things for your good because you love him and are called by him according to his purpose. I pray that you would know the hope to which he has called you. And then the next, the riches of his glorious inheritance. 
I learned something this week that I never knew before, and that is the very next phrase. It's mind-boggling, really. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. What does that mean? That his inheritance, which we talk about all the time, that we inherit the kingdom of God and what a glorious, wonderful thing that is. But here it is talking about his inheritance, which is you. His glorious inheritance in his holy people. And I was so amazed by that, struck by that, that I looked it up in many different commentaries to make sure that the one I read where I found this wasn't wrong. But they all agreed. This means that the inheritance of Jesus Christ is you. And it's glorious. Think about if you are friends with, um, oh, I don't know, name some wealthy person. Bill Gates. Good friends with Bill Gates. You're invited to Bill Gates' home for a um, birthday party. And you have to bring a gift. What do you buy Bill Gates? And the other thing is, you are one of those people, and I know a lot of you are, that when someone opens the gift you bring, you want it to be the gift of the day. You know, the one that they're like, they don't just say, oh, this is so nice, but they say, stop short with, with excitement that they finally got this gift. You, you are that gift for Jesus Christ. That was an amen. <laughs> that was a hallelujah. It is amazing. This little phrase and all that it holds. God's people are his inheritance. Jesus Christ, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. It was God's wish that we be swept up into God's divinity, as I've been saying the last few weeks, and I'll say it again, that beautiful concept of the dance uh, that is the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, always and eternally in time past and in time future, interrelating in love, in acceptance, in grace, in glory. And God wants to bring us into that wonderful, glorious, joy-filled dance. And bringing us in gives him great joy. And then we get to the next phrase in verse 19, his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, in the Greek, the words there are hyperbolon, megathos, dunamos. Now, hyper, we know what that is. It's extra. Mega, what is that? Big, extra. And dunamos, the word from which we get Dynamite. Hyper mega dynamite. That's the power that God has given us, that God longs to, that God has filled us with as his church. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Think of what power that is to raise someone from the dead. And I think what Paul is implying here is that for someone like you to have a relationship with God takes a whole lot of power. For someone like me to be forgiven and included in God's grace and in God's plans and purposes for creation takes a lot of power. But that power is there and that power has been poured out and that power is ours. That, I looked at the clock, 13 minutes. 
was the introduction. I thought I'd get a giggle, but I got fear. I'll move more quickly. Well, we'll see. So there are three things that Paul wants us to understand here because of um, what he's praying for, that we would understand our, the glorious hope that we have, that we would understand the glory that we are to God and understand the power that is available to us. And then uh, just in verse 23, I'm going to speak about... Um, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills us in every way. The church is to Jesus as the body is to the head. Now, there's candy over here. I saw it with my eyes, and my eyes sent a message to my brain, and my brain sent a message to my hand, well, to my stomach, which said, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and so my brain then receives that message and, and tells my hand to go, well, my feet first have to move, and my feet step, step, and, oh, it's a Snickers. My hand had to listen to my brain to pick that up, and I'm, I'm going to save it for later. That'd be rude to eat in front of you. But do you get what I'm saying? The brain tells the body what to do. Everything we do, the brain tells us to do. The brain controls. Now, this one's... Mm. Do you watch Ghosts? The sitcom, yeah. Have you watched the British one? The British one came on because of the writer's strike because they were looking for something to fill the time slots. But, it, you know, it's not as good as ours, but it's okay. But on, on that one, there's a guy, and, and if, you have ever, if you haven't watched Ghost, the, the people who are on there, and I see some of you nodding now who didn't nod before, you didn't admit it before, but now you, 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 know, you do. Um, the way you died is carried with you. One guy died without his pants on, so there he is without his pants for all eternity. Another guy died uh, with an arrow through his neck, and so that they cut off the end of the arrow, but for the rest of eternity, he has part of an arrow running through his neck. Another guy in the British version died by decapitation. So his head is off in one place, and his body is another place, and it makes him, it, it really is upsetting to him. Because he wants to get somewhere else and he can't because he doesn't have the body to do it. And his body walks around bumping into things because it doesn't know where, how to, where to see. Well, that is a very difficult position to be in. And every once in a while, the head and the body come together and he's just delighted. But so many... Christians try to live life disconnected from the head. They don't cultivate their relationship with Jesus Christ, so they don't know what they are called to do. They don't believe they have the power to do it. Jesus came upon one man, and he had a shriveled hand that just didn't work, had no life in it. And he said, stretch out your hand, and he did and life entered that hand. Friends, it is the, the power of God that will work through us when we follow him where he wants us to go. Now, another TV illustration, I'm sorry, but um, you know, or movies, wherever, you know that there's often a scene where someone is, a dog is digging or something, and they come across a hand. Sometimes it is the whole body, but sometimes it's just one part, a foot. And so they have to figure out whose foot is this and how is it here. And usually, didn't used to be this way, but usually they want us to feel as grossed out as possible. So they show us this foot not attached to a body. John Stott, a British pastor who died just a few years ago, said the gross, the, it is a gross anomaly for a Christian 
to be unchurched, for a Christian to be disconnected from the body. It is not right. And then there's the story of Jesus when he was being arrested and Peter took out his sword and lopped off Malchus's, the soldier's ear. And one pastor said, I think he just wasn't very, he didn't have very good aim. He was trying to, probably trying to get him at the top of the head. I don't know. But what he did accomplish is the removal of Malchus's ear. And what did Jesus Christ do immediately? He picked up that ear and put it back on Malchus's head. Jesus wants the body to be connected. And he has the power, if you feel disconnected, to reconnect you just as he did that ear. Verse 23, this goes along with his glorious inheritance is his holy people. God placed everything under his feet, Christ's feet, and appointed him to be head over everything, which is the church? No, for the church. I don't think we understand how much the work of Jesus Christ was for us, for the church, for the people who God is calling, whom God is calling to be his church and who we are as the church. Verse 23, his body, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The church is the fullness of Christ. In um, first. In Colossians 1.19, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, we read, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. And then here, Paul says, And that fullness dwells in the church. When we enter that dance, we are entering the fullness of it. So, friends... Stay connected, connected to the head who is Christ. Stay connected to the body, which is his church. And then finally, how we relate to the world because of this. Acknowledging that there are those who are in Christ, who are connected with God, who are connected dynamically with each other by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And what does that imply? It implies that there are others who are not. And I grieve when I see the church today and I see um, people who don't get it, especially when I see them not understanding how we relate to the world. There are people, um, for lack of better terms, who are on the far right of faith who say, world... I'm a Christian, you're supposed to be a Christian, so get with it and act like a Christian. Act like we do. Share our values, share our morals, share who God has revealed we are to be. That sounds good, right? A lot of people say that's the way it should be, and ultimately it will be, but those who are not in Christ do not have this power. They do not have a faith in God's word. They do not have reason to Follow God. And to tell them to behave a certain way does not bring them into fellowship with God. It is a fake kind of Christianity. What we are called to do is bring them in. To encourage people to speak about the grace of God, the love of God, and draw them into relationship with God. And then there are people, again, for lack of a better term, on the far left, who say, hey, world, look, we're just like you. We're no threat to you. It's all good. And both of these, and I think there's some of each of them in, in, in all of us, each of those viewpoints, um, but it's not, to, to think that way is not being the church. 
We are called to be different. And that's, I think, the, the motivation behind both of these views is that we don't want to be too different. We don't want to do the hard work of being different from the world around us. But if we are connected with God through the Holy Spirit, if we are uh, what God glories in, we will be different. And that means different from the world around us. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We are not to assume that the world will be like us, we'll, that we will fit easily into the world. Again, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. We are not going to make everybody happy if they reject the message of Jesus Christ. But we are called to share that message with love and grace and truth. Tim Keller compares Samson, the Old Testament prophet, with Jesus. Samson, if you remember the story, was a very, very, very strong man as long as his hair was long. And one day when his hair was long, he was at a large building with huge columns and people were annoying him. They weren't behaving the way he thought they should. So what he did, and he was, I think they had gouged out his eyes by that point. He was chained to this temple. And in his anger, what he did was he flexed his muscles and he pushed those columns and the building fell down on the people, killing them and him. He believed that the way to answer disobedient people was to crush them. Jesus, surrounded by disobedient people, surrounded by people scoffing and mocking him, also stretched out his arms. But not in defiance and not in a way to get rid of people, but in a way to bring them to God. It is a weak person who has to declare their strength over and over again, who has to flex their muscles all the time. Because true strength is having the power of God at work and believing enough to have integrity, believing enough to trust that God is at work through all circumstances and believing that our relationship with him is the most glorious thing we have and to allow other things to fall into their proper place. With Paul, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen. Lord, we pray that prayer for ourselves, and we pray that you, by your spirit, would strengthen us to truly be your people that we would understand more and more and more that the eyes of our hearts and minds would be opened to understand that you glory in us, that you treasure us, and that you have called us to love you and to serve you and to participate in your glorious kingdom now and forevermore.
God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who has called you is faithful, and he will do this. Amen. Tell me, is he good? He's good. Tell me, is he God? He's God. In the noontime, Jesus, when the sun goes down, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus, when the sun goes down.